Well, David Willison, thank you so much for taking the time to come on my show. Not at all. It's a pleasure to be with you. Absolute pleasure. And thank you so much for inviting me to your beautiful home. Mm-hmm. Um, so I th- figured I want to start this interview with a slightly unconventional route. Mm-hmm. I like to start off with your um, earliest performing experience, which I read somewhere, a biography somewhere, that you formed a piano trio with your brothers, I John yes, and indeed. Peter. Yes. John right. is the violinist and Peter's the cellist. Correct. Can you give us the, the story of how this brotherly co- collaboration came to be? Hmm. Well, I'm the eldest uh, in the family, and <clears throat> I was put on the piano at five years of age, fortunately on a very good, fine Beckstein piano. Uh, so I was lucky there. My brother, John, the violinist, uh, he was introduced to the violin by the same man that taught me in a matter of weeks after I started. So he was, in fact, four when he began. And he never looked back, became, in fact, was very quickly a very fine player. I think he's, for example, (laughs) intonation. I hardly ever heard him play a note out of tune. I mean, that is quite something, isn't it? And then my brother Peter, the he was four years younger than me, so we had to wait a little bit for him to, as it were, join, grow up. He began with the piano, in fact, and then quick, did not enjoy the piano, he says quite openly, but he suddenly heard one day Casals on the radio, mm. and suddenly the the light was lit, as it were, in in him for the sound of the cello. And he told his mother, our mother, and they, our parents managed to get him a quarter size viol- a cello. So I think the trio, when we get, I obviously, because I began to play little piano parts with my brother John for a, a few years, and that worked. And then Peter, he joined us. I suppose when he was possibly about nine, ten, and uh, by which time, of course, I was fourteen-ish. So that's when we started, and we we kind of gelled, you know. I mean, it was uh, when I think about it in the household, we each of us had to find a separate place to play, rehe- uh, to uh, practice. And I remember John had the bathroom, Peter <laughs> Peter had a another little room somewhere else, and of course I had the main room where the piano was. But anyway, we, we slotted it together. The very first piece we ever tried, uh, we heard, I think, of, oh, some one of us heard the performance of uh, the Haydn Gypsy Rondo Trio, as it's known, and we started with that. Uh, we knew nothing at all about trios at that time. We were fortunate where we were living in that um, uh, there was a lady who studied seriously piano in Germany, who was, who was in fact German, and she got in touch with my parents when she heard about us, and she said I could coach them properly, you see. So, and of course she knew the repertoire a little bit more than we did, and that's where we began. And so I was about 14, Peter was four years younger, and that was it really. So it was a musical household, my both my parents um, encouraged us. Um, my father a little bit of piano playing. My mother actually had a rather attractive alto voice, and <laughs> so all in all, we were really encouraged by our parents. Not in a forcible way at all, but I mean, hardly a word was said really. But I suppose we all got on with it really, and it was you know we just accepted it. We we could play this music and. Fortunately, my brothers were terrifically good. Was there a, a leader type within the trio? Someone who sort of mm. um, networked with people to get performances or decided repertoire? Was there one particular person? Well, this lady I mentioned, uh, who was uh, you know, a piano, pia- pianist, um, she recommended music that we might look at. I think from there, from the from the Haydn. I think the next one I remember was Mozart, one of the Mozart trios. The, um, <clears throat> and then, well, we branched out a little bit. We had a shot at uh, the uh, Schubert, one of the Schuberts. 
one of the movements anyway. And of course, we also were encouraged to where we were living in Essex in the South End on Sea area. We had these two uh, competitive music festivals, and uh, we uh, there was a chamber music class there. So we, of course, we went into it, uh, went into it, and play, that's where we played first. Played the Hyden, I remember. Uh, and the Gypsy Rondo, of course, part of that, the last movement of that famous piece, uh, um, was always a an audience pleaser. And uh, we we, as far as um, promoting, as it were, well, it in those days it was it was just this opportunity to, as, as I mentioned, where we were living, we had uh, two wonderful. Um, serious sort of music societies. One was a, a chamber music club, which was um, simply 150 people, roughly, from the area of South End, and a third of them, I think, could play various instruments, mm -hmm. and one or two singers. So we put on monthly. There were opportunities for a, a concert every month, and where we could get in, we obviously asked if we could play our latest learning you see so it was a bit like that and then we had the competitive festivals and both john and myself were going into those um and uh, john was outstanding obviously and john uh, walked away with everything i think prizes wise and uh, there was a bit more competition for the piano players as there always is <laughs> too many piano players yeah. <laughs> or oh, you can't have too much of a good thing i know um I'm always amazed when I read these figures of you know, 40 million Chinese students learning the piano. Uh, what's come to mind straight away there? But no, I mean playing the piano. I think uh, I've been fortunate. I think it's a, it's uh, it's as far as I'm concerned, it gives you the access to so much wonderful music mm. that um, you know we're just spoiled for choice as pianists, aren't we? And there I was with John and Peter, you know, who have just single lines of notes to play. And, uh, yes, we, we broadened out a bit. I remember going <clears throat> to Ealing, for example, and Wimbledon, at the music festivals there. And with John, we went to uh, Ealing, I remember, and played Beethoven Sonata. Uh, yes, it was... It was a it was a good time in South. I should tell I should say and remind uh, remind people that um, South End was a fantastic and and still probably is in a way uh, area for music making and uh, amongst young people it's quite a big area and of course it's just been awarded the city status has it not? Uh, but culturally, we had two symphony orchestras. Yeah, there was so much opportunity, and so many of my friends over the years have actually lived in that part of the world. We, I grew up with at least four, four or five mus musical youngsters there, and all of us have made music as a career. And even you know, I mentioned ben Benjamin Grosvenor, who's the latest sort of from South End on Sea. To he's made his name in a very big way, of course, and is making it. But no, and it was just a wonderful time of discovery. We were all enjoying it. We were all playing in these small bands and chamber groups and individually. I had a very good pianist uh, relationship with playing, um, for example, two pianos and piano duets. Uh, 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 Brian Lamport, by name, um, well-known, in fact. Um, he... he uh, spent a lot of his life uh, teaching in the Mozarteum in Salzburg. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But he, like myself, was went to the same school. We were encouraged at school for music. Uh, it, my brother John was, uh, for instance, he went to the same school, Westcliff High School. And uh, he was allowed time off from lessons to actually go and practice out of lessons. It didn't uh, fall to my fortune to do that, or the pianist, but John for some, was given that uh, opportunity. Why do you think he was given? Why? Oh, yeah. Well, I think it was to do with, with the fact that he had become, uh, he was, he became leader of the National Youth Orchestra 
at a tender age. And the lady who ran the orchestra, Ruth Railton at the time, um, said to John, you know, where are you being taught? John was being taught by an ex Halle member, violinist, in South End, uh, which was actually a very good um, discipline because this man insisted on intonation as being one of the hallmarks of any violin or string player. And I remember going to a, a lesson with, with him, with John, and we took along Bach um, concerto, violin concerto. And I don't think, uh, we spent an hour on this piece, but we didn't do more than two bars <laughs> because this man was insistent on the tuning of every note to uh, the next note. And so John spent all that time, and I think John has, you know, I think he would say that he's probably benefited from that discipline. Anyway, he, wa he was being taught there, and Ruth Railton said to him, well, look, um, I think you could probably benefit and go and see a lady called Ruth Railton, who was uh, a member from, uh, she'd come over from um, American, uh, American School of Music, and she was a specialist in technique, violin technique. And John went and had lessons, and she stipulated a regime that he had to follow, and he had to do so much every day. It was very precise, and it meant that if he, if he was going to get through, I think he was two hours a day he had to do, and this was basically on technique, violin technique. But uh, that time, so that was one of the reasons I think he had to uh, mm. take out of school time. But it, it pay, I mean, John would say it paid off, um, no question about it. But it was a discipline that he had that, for example, my piano lessons never had. I was never really disciplined uh, looking back on it uh, in the way that he was in that. Um, I think I had to struggle to get to the place I got to technically and so on and so forth. I suppose I had a fluency, but I wasn't, you know, I wasn't sort of, uh, um, what do you call a um, very gifted youngster. I had to find it out for myself over the years, work out problems. I didn't have teachers who really, I mean, maybe they thought I didn't have problems and maybe I didn't let on I had problems, but it was a bit like that and I had to find my own way. I always remember Brendel talking in a similar vein, actually, Alfred Brendel saying that he was sort of self-taught, you know, and uh, he wasn't a gifted child, but clearly he was. Uh, so, you know, some of us have to uh, find our own way, I suppose. You're lucky if you find a really great teacher, I think, yeah, in your young years, and those that do, good luck, you know. It, um, but on the other hand, maybe the struggle is uh, another way of getting to the, the very fact that you have to. I think it probably helps when you try to tell others or try to teach others. I mean, I always sort of enjoyed my piano teaching as such, which I did quite a lot of in the early years until I was able to play uh, concert stuff. Um, so, yes, I think the very fact that you have to work it out yourself uh, does um, mean something when it comes to helping other people because mm. you know what the problem is. Yes, yeah. And when you teach it, you unpack it with the student. Yes, exactly. And you learn during the process. Oh, indeed. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. Indeed, indeed. I wondered if for the audience... I wondered if you could give an example of a difficulty you had to overcome when you were learning the piano, a technical difficulty, for example, and mm -hmm. how you overcame that. Hmm. Um, I think the f one of the major difficulties that I can think of straight off is um, octave playing. I think it's probably quite a problem for a lot of pianists. <laughs> <laughs> not just purely myself. I remember, uh, I remember the um, Wander of Fantasy, for example, of Schubert, you know, which has formidable octave movement in it in places, out of the blue suddenly, and 
you're really taken by surprise. You see it coming up like a mountain, you know, a huge mountain to climb sometimes. But I felt that um, octave playing. Now, what did I do about octave playing? Well, and another piece that involves octaves, uh, perhaps even more complicated, would be the the, the famous um, Opus 1 of Schubert. No, not Opus 1, sorry. Um, that's uh, a different one, isn't it? But the Earl King song with the famous triplet octaves for the right hand that don't stop for about four minutes and uh, go at rather a swift pace to say the least for well and that is a that's a different technique actually come to think of it isn't it because it tends to be static on one one note uh, that has its own problems how do you work at it well oh well how i worked at it was to start with a couple of a couple of them, just two. You know, the first two quavers. Get that going. Perhaps put an accent on the first one. Put, put an accent on the second one. Then put number three and put three together, and gradually sort of build it like a brick wall, brick by brick, octave by octave. And <clears throat> other ways of going. I also found that working out a phrase backwards was quite a useful way. So in other words, you'd start at the end. Let's take say I don't know. 12, oct 12 notes in the octave, 12 repeating quavers, that is. So you'd start with number tw 11 and 12, da-dum. Then you'd work to 10, 11 and 12, da-da-da-da-dum. Then also do it at different, um, uh, bring rhythm into it. Think of different rhythms for it, dotted rhythm. One equal two quicker, two quick, dum da da dum. You know, whatever you can think of, of quite a few rhythms, and so it would be like that. It would be gradually sort of piecing a thing together, and also, I think the physical side of well, anyway, without going into this in great depth, mm -hmm. um, it, um, it it sort of worked. If you took a uh, the other thing that I mentioned, technique there that I was never given any you know churny or any technique of. Uh, technical exercises to do as a young pianist. Uh, I was given, I was suggested that I did Shirney Opus 101 um, to start with. I played two or three of those, three or four of them, and then I thought, I'm not quite sure what's the point of this uh, because I can easily take a bit of Mozart or a bit of, well, I'll take Mozart and, and take a few phrases of Mozart and, and A, it sounds more like music than anybody else, and work at the the technical detail of a, a phrase of Mozart, or yes, a phrase of Mozart, uh, a, a perhaps a scalic music, a scalic figure, you know, of from a from a sonata perhaps, and literally think of as many different ways as you possibly can uh, to shape that phrase and to put a rhythm into that phrase. Mess about with it, really, you know. In, simple words hmm. and see how you can play and sometimes when you do that you sometimes it sometimes it did with me it it solved a little problem that i wasn't uh, necessarily sort of thinking i needed to solve if you can see what i'm saying uh, but it would unlock something that would lead to lead one on to something mm -hmm. else you know it was a bit of a mystery but uh, i always used music uh, you know proper proper composed music by proper composers be they Mozart or Bach again and you know I started on Bach preludes and fugues for example quite early on and I thought those were the best finger technique that I'd ever come across and I still think it I still play those pieces almost daily and they are the best work up for the fingering for fingers that I know you know you try and play the first six preludes of the 24, for example, just the preludes, apart from the fugues, and it'll take you through, you know, almost the whole scenery of piano technique. And then try and play a fugue. Any fugue. And my goodness, your left hand has got to be as good as your right, hasn't it? There's no getting away from it. You cannot escape reality in, in something like Bach. Have you performed any of Bach's Prelude and Fugues? 
uh, I did in one or two festivals. Um, I, funnily enough, I'm getting the opportunity to, to play one or two in a local recital here that's going to happen next January on Mozart's birthday, actually January the twenty seventh. So I'm playing it. I'm playing, uh, working a program not just by myself with a baritone singer, locally baritone here, who I've got to know, and we're doing a mix program and. It's been suggested that I play some piano in between the song. And I'm going to be playing a bark, a little bit of bark. Going back to the idea of practice, um, that's something I I discovered too. There's something about really putting a piece to its limits in the practice room, you know, stretching it, tearing it apart, mm. really, really putting it to its limits. You know, for example, playing some right hand melodies in the left hand, for example, and switching your hands over just to sort of strengthen the two hemispheres of the brain. Mm, yes. And then once you've done that, all the tearing, all the stretching, if you put it back together again for a performance, it just feels. It's somehow eased it out. It's easier. It? Yes. It's yes, easier. Yes. It's sold. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. And, that, and that brings me to this um, next point. It's a quote I don't know who to attribute to, but someone said. Um, you should never practice something until you can get it right. You should practice something until you can't get it wrong. Is that something you agree with or partially agree with or do you have your own? Well, in some ways, yes. I yes. can see where they're coming from. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. Yeah. Practice something until you cannot go wrong. Mm. Well, I think every performance, every time you play, it's somehow, for me, it's, it's different. There's something different about it. Mm. Um, it's There's never a final, as it were, take it out of your pocket performance. For me, there isn't. Um, maybe it's a, a sort of discipline thing. I don't know. But I, I sometimes marvel, you know, there are a few pianists around who you know who would be able to literally repeat it note for note dynamic for dynamic the same way each time uh, I don't think I could do that because as I'm playing uh, this this sound is involved is evolving I think that's the only way I can put it is evolving as it were as I'm going along and I I think if that is there's a sort of spontaneity element about that which I think is absolutely wonderful to feel you don't always feel it but, but um, I, I like to think that, I mean, I don't want to be in a position where I know that I'm, you know, there's a hurdle coming up, which I may not get over. And I will obviously, if I know that as I'm working at the piece prior to playing it somewhere, that, um, well, I'd be very foolish if I didn't try and solve it in practice. But as um, <clears throat> my wife, Pamela, always reminds me if, if something goes wrong, well, I say, I say to her, well, you know, if I can do it once, I can do it twice. And the other, I used to remember, <laughs> sometimes when I was teaching and uh, a student would perform something and then they'd perhaps, you know, play a wrong note or something would go wrong. And at the end of it, they would swear under their breath. And so, and I'd say, look, and they would be so disappointed with it themselves uh, my answer, answer to that was, well, come on. Um, you know, the wimmer, winner of Wimbledon, for example, will hit some balls into the net and yet still win. I know that these days you can't accept too many wrong notes in performances, and we don't get too many these days. I mean, the standard of playing is phenomenal, really, looking back over my 80-odd years. Uh, when I think of how some players got away with it, to be honest, way back then, very famous names, actually. But now you can't get away with it. I suppose it's all to do with recording and it's to do with, you know, it's being seen on television and so on and so forth. It's there forever. So, yes, we have to. Sorry, it's a rather long no, no. answer to your question. But <laughs> it's an interesting answer. Um uh, just sort of touching back on that point of pianists nowadays becoming more and more accurate hmm. in their playing. 
Do you think CD recordings and TV broadcasts, frequent TV broadcasts, are the reason people are getting better? This is the pressure that pianists are having these days, or do you think there's another reason for this increase in technical ability? That's an interesting question. Yes, I think it it may be that may be well be a, one of the reasons. One of the reasons. Yes, and I think I think the ability for everyone to uh, see everyone else now, you know, whereas I could not, when I was young, I could not, there was no television, really, and certainly. Uh, there were a few records to listen to. Um, so that I suppose I've grown up in a period where it's become more obvious that, that um, standards have, general standards, I think, general piano playing standards, I would have thought, and maybe more people are playing piano than they used to. That's another factor. So therefore, you will get more outstanding people coming forward. But, um, I mean, and also, of course, the competitions, that, you know, the worldwide competitions. I mean, when I was young, we didn't have the Leeds Piano Competition. And I remember the first winner of that, Michael Roll, I seem to remember. Um and Fanny Waterman, you know, st starting that up. That was uh, I couldn't have got in for a competition. There, was, there weren't any. Um, I can't remember when the Tchaikovsky started. I probably wouldn't have made it anyway. But the, um, you know, there were there were none of those things around now. And they've grown up in my lifetime, mm -hmm. and of course have fostered, I suppose, the uh, this. Um, well, exactly what you were saying. The you know the outpouring of many, many fine talents that have had a showcase through competitions um, that I never came across as a young man. Mm. And I think also many young pianists have a wealth of piano technique from generations to, to start off from. Mm -hmm. So that could be another reason for this increase in technical ability, possibly. Yes, yes. I think it's a it's a complicated question, really, isn't yes. it? it um, but I mean, it, for the health of the uh, the health of music, uh, classical music in particular. Um, I mean, I don't abhor competition, really. I don't think that uh, it's it's just an an outlet for all that work that you've put in. And it is a struggle. It's a supreme struggle of the concentration required and the skill. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm not only pianist, but I marvels at string playing and all the instruments, really. I mean, it's happened all the way through, hasn't it? All the, in, all the in classical musical instruments, competitions for harp, mm -hmm. competitions for you name it, French horn and so on. Um, you know, the world has sort of woken up to to all this and uh, I, yeah I think it's I have to I have to think it's only good for you know the future of music I'm not a pessimist as far as I think there are pessimists around who say oh well pop has taken over everything mm -hmm. um, well it may have you know but I think Bach will still be there when perhaps I'm not going to mention any pop groups but um <laughs> Some of them may not be there mm -hmm. when Bach is still being played, mm -hmm. and Mozart, and Beethoven, and the rest. It's a nice segue into awards and competitions. Um, during your earlier days, you won prizes for solo playing. Mm -hmm. You know, playing Schumann's Carnival, yep. and uh, Wonder of Fantasy, you can mm -hmm. won the prize for that. Mm. Um, and then you went on to have a tremendous accompanying career, playing all, all over the world. And I just wondered, where was that pivot point? Because you had your great talent and skill in solo playing, mm. and you also had a tremendous talent in accompanying too. So sometimes, for maybe some pianists out there, that's a... <laughs> Yes. Okay. It's, uh, it's well. I, th I I I imagine anyway I, that it goes back to my early years with my brothers. Mm -hmm. The fact that I was playing piano parts to their string parts 
from a very early age. And I think, uh, you know, the, the sort of teamwork. And I also love playing uh, piano duet with somebody else. I think also, I, I when I play by myself, or when I did, I felt it was... I don't know what it was quite. There was a, I, Somewhere in me was a sort of feeling of I'm climbing this mountain by myself. I'd rather have somebody to climb with me. Um, and I think the also the, the thing that also excited me was the working with... Um, I moved on, of course, from string players and to singing, singers... And of course, singers need piano players all the time. Otherwise, they can't work. And I think it was the repertoire that I suddenly came across when I was a sort of uh, mature student at uh, Guildhall School of Music, where I came to meet the most important man, I suppose, in my career, Benjamin Luxon, the baritone, who had a stellar career. And he was very keen also on working with song and piano, voice and piano, not just the operatic side of things. Uh, of course, the voice and piano and the recital there is is a bit of a rarefied um, happening. Uh, it's, it's number Z on the musical club circuit, for example, you know, who always want a piano followed by a string quartet, followed by something else. And so the You've got to be a special person, singer-wise, to make your mark in the recital world. And Luxon had that wonderful communicative ability, apart from a fabulous baritone voice. And he and I met at Guildhall. And as a result of that, I was suddenly introduced a repertoire I'd never come across, of course, of the, the great German writers, Schubert's and the Schumann's in particular, Brahms as well, of course. And he and I got to learn this music. We suddenly were devouring it as students, going in and working for hours on this music together. And the other thing that he was so gifted in was um, performing Engl in, in English, the English repertoire. And again, of course, there is a mountain of English repertoire to look at. That uh, what was your original question on this? It was that um, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, you had a you had potential in solo repertoire, and yes. then you had a tremendous. But it, it took me over. I mean, I yeah. was just simple, and I think it was I sort of forgot about playing by myself. I just wanted to play play this repertoire. That's not to say that I didn't still, you know, play a Mozart sonata or whatever, um, but. I think it was also the the fact that the, there was this opportunity to learn all this material. The other thing is I, I've probably got a short attention span, actually. And I think that the vocal repertoire, you know, lasts on average, a song is, typical song is, what, three to four minutes? And then you're into another total world. And I that I really took to. I, I You know, if you take something like, Take any one of the cycles, you know, take, I don't know, for the sake of argument, take Dichter, Lieber, Schumann. And it's just full of the most wonderful piano writing. And, of course, you put the voice onto it, and that's an extra, obviously. But at the end of, you know, two minutes of piano, a, a song, Dichter, Lieber, for example, you go into another totally different ball game you know as far as technique piano playing and I think the the variety was the, the other thing that got to me the tremendous variety that was possible when you were doing this repertoire and um, I wish actually over the looking back I'd had an opportunity to do more French repertoire Debussy perhaps and um, the, that school but anyway I was totally absorbed with uh, the whole of that generation from, well, a little bit of Beethoven, of course, uh, if we're talking about vocal, and obviously, clearly, 600 Schu Schubert songs keeps you busy, and uh, I don't know how many Schumann wrote, uh, 300 or so, 
And then, of course, there's another two or three hundred by Brahms. And so you go on. I mean, when I looked on YouTube, I, I noticed that I think there were about three or four hundred songs that I played on YouTube, you know, which each one is different. Hardly one with the same musical... Um, uh, yes, yeah, so, you know, each one, as I say, is unique. That was what's so enticing about it, wasn't it? Mm. And I, I, I think I, I just gobbled this up. You know, I just loved the, the variety. Distilled in just two or three minutes. When you were doing these song cycles, were these songs memorized or partially? Memorized. For me, yes. No, I've never had a. a, a mem- I think because probably I, I was a pretty good sight reader, I have to say, yeah. um, and I think that the ability to do that meant that I didn't really concentrate sufficiently, perhaps, on the memory side of things. And of course, one didn't have to, doesn't have to memorize for that work, that particular work. You're not expected to. Um, I'm not sure. I, no, I, I, memory in myself would be uh, a different thing. I mean, I, I memorized when I was younger those things like the Schubert Wanderer. That was memory, but um, uh, otherwise, of course, the you know the repertoire I was doing he would um, not require you to memorize. I, I think I'm trying to remember anybody who has memorized amongst the professional. Um, Pianist to work with, you know, in chamber music or whatever. I do remember seeing Andras Schiff, which I was very impressed, uh, playing the um, piano part to Shepherd on the Rock from memory. And that takes some doing, considering there's 5,000 triplets to be played <laughs> <laughs> or something like that. Yeah. He does that a lot. In master classes, he plays a, a Schubert song to reference a Schubert sonata. He's teaching. Have I it. played in master? Oh give? no, no, that's what Andrew Schiff does. Oh right, yes, okay. In, in master classes, yeah, uh, right, which I find really impressive. Yes, yes. Um, yes. So, the the art of accompanying, uh, assuming that the obvious is stated, so a comp- the difference between accompanying and solo is accompanying. You're doing. You're doing a, p- a performance with a singer mm-hmm. or an instrumentalist. Yeah. Apart from that fact, I was wondering if you could tell us what other differences are there between accompanying and solo playing? Well, in the first place, you've got to be able to play the piano as well as uh, requ- required. I, I'm just going to divert for a second and tell you a little story yes. that happened when I was uh, asked to do a BBC lunchtime recital. And um, I was sent a contract by the BBC in which I noted that the fee was the same as it had been for a few years. So I thought, and then I suddenly remembered that the previous week there'd been a very, I might have better not mention the name, but one of the, top six pianists in the world are also given a recital in the, on the same piano, in the same hall. And something in me said, I've got a feeling that I'm being undervalued here financially. I'm quite sure I'm playing almost as many notes as that pianist did last week. And I'm pretty sure that he's getting 10 times what the BBC is offering me. And I actually got in touch with the BBC and put this point to them. And they said, they were very good, actually. And they said, oh, you've got a point. I I I then received a new contract, which doubled my fee. In other words, what I'm really trying to say there is that you've got to be up to the highest level you can be. I mean, you know, the best... Pianists who play with, take Baron Boyum. I mean, he had a period of his life when he was playing for Janet Baker and was, you know, was playing with Fischer Discal, the big song cycles. And it, 
he wasn't the only pianist doing that. You know, I've just mentioned uh, um, whose name has totally gone now from my memory. Um, but plenty of so you know concert artists who are solo pianists most of the all the time have um, worked with the finest say singers or instrumentalists and what is the difference you know i mean if you're if barrymore is going to i can give you an instance of this of a recording of that i did with luxon of hugo wolf a cycle of 50 songs um at the time i recorded them with luxon way back in the 70s i wasn't we weren't to know it but in a, a studio, a recording studio in Germany, Daniel Barenboim and and Fischer Diskow were at work doing exactly the same repertoire that we were doing, except for a different record company. Uh, to only to find we no, none of this was known to the other record company, as it were. So of course, these two versions came out almost at the same time. So if Barenboim was good enough to do it with Fischer Diskow. I could kind of say, well, I suppose, where was I in relation to Barenboim, you know, playing the same repertoire? Did you listen to their... Oh, yes. Music? Yeah. Of course. And it's like all, you know, great music, that there, that there is room for more than one thought on the same phrase or same... <laughs> touch or whatever you mm. know how, how do you be a good accompanist how do you be a good hmm. how do you be a good accompanist Gerald Moore of course wrote the famous book The Unashamed Accompanist first attempt to explain the noble art and then he wrote a second volume called Am I Too Loud? <laughs> uh, which both, of course, I read. Um, Am I Too Loud? I mean, that's something that's so basic, isn't it, uh, with working with somebody else. Uh, that has got... I could go on for quite a long time about the sound of the piano. I don't know that I can really answer this question. Um Because whoever you work, whoever you work with, they have a unique sound themselves. Whatever the voice is, even I mean that even applies to string players. Well, it applies to most instruments, doesn't it? And somehow, you know, the piano sound, of course, which is, as it were, dependent on the piano you've got, rather than the voice you've got. And you, yes, loudness, that sort of comes into it, but I don't know that I can, I don't know really whether I'm able to quite explain the chemistry there the, between the piano sound and the sound that you're working with. Uh, some people, it seems as though it, it just, your the sound that you make on a piano um, seems to sort of just, tone in with them others y you kind of fight it at, at times i think you but basically i mean you are the piano player you are and you can't change too much the way you you know the your sound i mean it is said isn't it that you put six different six different people on a piano and you can tell the difference between each one if you've got a sensitive ear um so <laughs> It's a, it's a bit of a bit of magic there. I think that I can't quite explain. Is it a mixture of experience and intuition? Oh yes, I think I think it has to be, doesn't it? Yeah, I think you can get better at it. Mm. I think you can, yes, you do find. I think you do find occasionally players who perhaps play all the time by themselves what we call soloists, 
who would find it difficult to perhaps adjust to somebody else's mannerisms, phrasing. And um, I think I have occasionally, you know, come across a lot of uh, fisticuffs, as it were, musical fisticuffs with somebody who won't give way because they think it's the way to do it. And um, But mm, I think if I'm getting paid, I'll perhaps go along with what the uh, payer of the tune wants. Um, it's obvious that if you work with different people, you you will have a different way of playing. Um, and you've traveled over the world. Have different countries affected your interpretation? Different audiences changed the way you interpreted the piece? I My first instinct is to say, I don't think so. Sure. I don't think so. I think um, sometimes the atmospheres and sometimes halls where you're playing make can make a difference to how you feel about things and can can put you in a, a sort of uh, mood of... And sometimes, of course, as far as piano playing goes, the actual instrument that you're given, that you turn up to find, that can alter your slightly alter your feelings, I think, and make either life more difficult or make life easier. Um, and I remember, you know, one or two uh, wonderful instruments that I came across. I'm remembering, for example, one in Vienna in the Brahms Saal in uh, the Musikverein in Vienna where there's uh, just the most wonderful, I think it's, I could almost say, one of the finest pianos I think I've ever met, Bersendorfer out there, the Viennese piano, of course. And the, in that, with that instrument, in that particular concert room, and with an audience in there who sort of balanced the sound out a bit, everything was absolutely perfect. You could put your finger on the key, and you just, something said to you, spoke to you, that sometimes, you know, even... Uh, even in famous halls, doesn't happen. And you have to kind of go through the motions, as it were, sometimes a bit, um, and get the job done, which is awful, but can't be helped. But no, sometimes, so I think yeah, sometimes atmospheres and things, uh, and acoustics in mm. particular, acoustics and instruments, in our case, pianists, make all the difference. Mm. And that maybe changes you slightly. I mean, I mean, I, I, I felt when I played in that Vienna place that I just couldn't do a thing wrong. It was, you know, one's fingers were sort of on this wonderful keyboard and the sound that was coming out was a dream, you know, my ideal. And it was like that. And I think probably it was quite a decent uh, performance. <laughs> <laughs> so the instrument was working with you? Yes, that's not right. Against you. Not against you. Because some, right. some instruments do work. They do, <laughs> don't they? You, I'm sure you speak from experience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's quite a rare occasion for me to to find an instrument that works with me. It's very mm. rare. Mm. Um, but yes. clearly you know about pianos and piano playing with your experience. How if, yes, mm. yes. And the experience. I've been told that <laughs> by a friend. <laughs> uh, let's go back to collaborating with singers. Do you have a general skeleton approach when working with singers? What do you do first with singers? Or is it a one-by-one a -one basis, individual basis? Mm -hmm. Ideally, you know your part. They know yeah. their part yeah, uh, as best. And you bring it together. And you hope a huge percentage of it clicks. You know, f particularly phrasing, of course, and... Uh, And if you're fortunate enough to work with, you know, fine musicians, that's half the, more than half the battle, isn't it? But if you go along not knowing what you should know about your own part, if it's undercooked, <laughs> well, then you're concentrating on your own part and you probably can't be having sufficient concentration, you know, for what's being sung in this case, or played. 
So I think the better you know yourself and your part, the you know the more chances are that everything will work pretty well. I remember once with um, when I first, the very first time I worked with Elizabeth Schwarzkopf, for example. Uh, I'd heard her, obviously I knew her, she certainly didn't know me, but um, I'd had this recommendation from no less than Gerald Moore that I should go and work with her, and um, so I was found myself at the piano um, playing, in fact, a Schubert song, which I hadn't previously known until I was told that that was part of the repertoire. So I'd worked at this song for a few days, and um, I only had a short time to actually get ready for this and when I did turn up and play it um, I think I knew as much about it as I needed to know put it that way uh, I was happy with what I was doing and as a result when I'd started and played my introduction she she began and um, she was so faultlessly accurate, if you can be faultlessly accurate, um, that I found myself listening and, uh, well, yes, of course you sort of half listen to your own sound and half listen to what is being sung. That's another point about about playing with others. You have to listen to your own noise, own sound and as well as the other and sort of have this idea of mixing them somewhere in the ether. But at the end of this first time ever with her, everything went slotted into place. We phrased together, you know, everything dynamically was seemed to be right. And we looked at each other and she said, let's go on, that's fine. You know, it was almost as like that. And um, When did you first meet Elizabeth Schwarzkopf? Elizabeth Schwarzkopf? Yeah. Oh, I had it was a very sudden uh, happening, really. Um, and she was had been giving her farewell recitals in America with Jeffrey Parsons, the pianist, and Jeffrey Parsons unfortunately fell fell sick on before the just at the uh, pretty well at the final recital. I suddenly had a phone call from Elizabeth Schwarzkopf's husband, Walter Legg, to say that he'd, be, he'd been uh, told by, or he'd spoken to Gerald Moore, he wanted a substitute because they still had to give, there I say, uh, she had to give three more recitals in Europe with Geoffrey, it would have been, but who could replace Geoffrey? And Gerald Moore had said, that they should get in contact with me. And this phone call came through from New York, and I was literally sort of hired on the spot, as it were, by Walter Legg, of course, the great impresario, record producer, founder of the Philharmonia, etc., etc. And Walter gave me all the instructions as to how to get to see them very quickly. Could, they, could I come out in a matter of days because they were desperate? They had this La Scala uh, concert to do, a recital to do. And uh, anyway, I collected the music from Jeffrey and um, took myself off, having spent many hours trying to learn a, re a little bit of repertoire which I'd never played before aided by my wife's physiotherapy on my shoulders, I remember at the time, working into the late hours of the night on Strauss songs in particular. I found myself out in uh, Cap Ferrat, where they'd just moved, and um, I, I literally was staying with them for three or four days prior to this La Scala concert, which I'd never played in. I hadn't played in, yes, I had played in Italy, uh, on the Italian radio with Luxon. But, um, yeah, so then I met her th there at their home, and uh, that's why earlier where I mentioned that uh, Schubert song with her. That was the very first thing I ever did. And, of course, they'd never heard me. 
play. They didn't know what to expect, even though Gerald had said I was up to it. Uh, and of course, uh, Walter, who was in on every session of, re of rehearsal, it was keen, absolutely keen, that everything went tickety-boo. And at the end of that first Schubert song, I don't think I mentioned this, that uh, he sort of leant back and with a sigh in his voice, or relaxed he was, <laughs> saying that he realised that they'd got the right person at the keyboard. <laughs> so... Yeah, so that was uh, that was the, how I got to uh, to uh, perform with uh, Elizabeth Schwarzkopf. How did that make you feel that you were accepted like that? Yes, it was a. Uh, I suppose looking back, it was a real fillip to one's um, yeah. It kind of cemented something in one. You know, working with somebody like that who was kind of at the time one of the greatest singers of that repertoire amongst the ladies and um, it uh, we went I mean that was just a dream playing in the Scala Piccola Scala the small concert hall adjacent to the opera theatre again with a wonderful acoustic and a very fine piano for me Mm -hmm. and an audience that was just simply wanting to hear her. Uh, the place was overflowing with people, and, uh, I mean, it was just, just one of those sort of experiences that you know, I'll never, one would never forget, really. At the end of it all, this audience would not let her go, and we did encore after encore, and flowers rained down on the keyboard on the stage. I'd never known anything like it. They don't throw flowers at baritones. But, my goodness, it was a hailstone of petals <laughs> everywhere. Wonderful, actually. And <laughs> I remember having to wipe <laughs> wipe um, flowers, stem flowers off the keyboard to play the old core. It was like that, you know. But um, there was one little momentary blurb on the, on the on that concert was when the third encore I think it was was a rather complicated piano part in it and um, uh, Elizabeth had been um, sh sort of trying to uh, keep a slight throat at bay the whole of the day of this concert and <laughs> as we walked on to she stopped as we were just literally to go on the stage for the third encore and said to me, oh, you know, this throat of mine, um, do you think you could possibly lower the key? Could you transpose this piece for me? And I suddenly took fright. I, I thought, I'm not sure I can do this accurately. This will spoil the whole caboose. And I walked out in a semi-daze. I don't, can't remember them. And I sat down at the keyboard. A silence. I had to start up. And I, as I said earlier about memory, it would have helped, I think, if I could have memorized this piece and transposed it. But it was not an easy piano part. And I simply looked at the key, looked at the score, and my fingers went to the notes that I saw on the page. And I simply played it in key. She went through the song perfectly. There was no problem at all. And we walked off. We walked on again. As I came off, <laughs> she said in the wings, did you transpose that by any chance? Did you transpose that? It felt very easy for me. But I knew she was kidding me. She knew perfectly. She had perfect pitch. She knew perfectly well I hadn't transposed it. Anyway, we looked at each other and burst into laughter. And she she said, oh, that was marvellous from my point of view. I've got through it. Mm -hmm. uh, so she was really very humble and very down to earth, actually. And you wouldn't, I think, the sometimes the reputation that goes around for with famous artists, isn't always the accurate one. She was very easy to work with, mm. and there was no pretense. There was no... it. Um, those stories, as far as I could see, and I worked with her mm. five or six recitals, I think. Uh, I, I saw none of that. Mm -hmm. 
she was after the truth in the music. She was a perfectionist in that respect. And if something you know wasn't absolutely right, she'd say so. And she and she knew what she was talking about as well. Mm. Uh, she didn't really have to be coached. That leads me smoothly on to the last question of the episode. I wish we can talk for longer, but due to the time limits, I have to end it now. But if um, you could come out of retirement and work once more with the person you've worked with for, who would that be? I think, can I give you two people? Sure. Okay. <clears throat> One would be the tenor, Anthony Rolf Johnson, who tragically died 11 years ago now, I think, um, who's, who was simply uh, absolute delight to work with. He had the most wonderful, of course, lyrical tenor voice. Um, but again, he was a sort of natural musician. Uh, that would be one. I'd love to have done more repertoire with him. Um, and also, well, of course, Ben Luxon, whose career was cut short, really, for a few years by his hearing and deafness and tinnitus. That was a tragedy. I think in anything I did with Ben until he had those problems in the final years, you know, was always an event, always, always look forward to it. Never, ever did I not want to do it. And uh, others, let me think. Um, um, of the instrumentalists, I think I'd have liked to have done a bit more cello repertoire with, I was working with a young, very gifted boy, young man, Thomas Igloy, Hungarian, who came over in the 1956 um, invasion of Czechoslovak, of uh, Hungary, and came to live in England and came to live quite near where I was living at the time. And we struck up a a relationship which was um, furthered really by broadcasting together. Uh, and um, I think, yes, I enjoyed working with him. I'm There are others, obviously, I could name, I suppose, but uh, you asked me for two, I think. Or one. <laughs> <laughs> well, David Willison, thank you very much. Well, it's been a pleasure to uh, I'll try and answer your lucid questions <laughs> thank you